Ohio State wide receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. is expected to be the first wide receiver off the board. And in the meanwhile, he's setting a precedent for the way that we might look at the draft in the future. We got all that coming up for you on today's episode of Locked On NFL. You are Locked On NFL. Your daily NFL podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's going on, football fans, and welcome in to another episode of Locked on NFL here on this beautiful Friday here on the show. You got Tony Wiggins at Shop Talking Wig, myself, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson, NOLA. And on today's episode of Locked on NFL, we're taking a look at a couple of big NFL draft storylines. We're going to take a look at a little bit of a chicken and egg problem for the for the, the NFL as a whole. Do bad organizations choose bad players or do bad players create bad organizations we're going to discuss and debate our thoughts on that we're also going to take a look at teams that draft late in the first round that have before and could again strike gold and to kick us all off we're taking a look at ohio state wide receiver marvin harrison jr no media at the combine no drills at the combine nothing going on at the pro day is he potentially setting a precedent for what we could see nfl draft prospects do in the future when you know they're at the top of their position group. We appreciate you very much for being an everydayer and making us your first listen of the day here on the Locked on NFL podcast, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked on NFL is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Make every moment more. You can win up to two hundred dollars in bonus bets as a first time customer. If your first five dollar bet wins, head over to FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started tony uh marvin harrison jr has been making a lot of noise while not making a lot of noise and honestly i don't think he's gonna suffer for it and could potentially be laying out a blueprint for how guys at the top of their game and top of their position group could approach the nfl draft process moving forward absolutely uh you know it's copycat league right and Mm -hmm. and players tend to do what other people do you see a lot of guys talking now like they're going to get hire a lawyer instead of they're following Lamar Jackson. We don't need an agent. We're just going to get somebody <laughs> to negotiate contracts for us, right? I just hope nobody goes down there and gets like the used car set, like Saul, you know, right. better yes. call yeah, Saul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, dude's just <laughs> getting people out of jail from, you know, come on, man, I'll negotiate. Yeah, I don't need an people. agent. I got a bail bondsman I can call yeah, right yeah, quick. Yeah, I'll yeah, be fine. Better call I'll be Saul, right? <laughs> no, but really, I, I, when I thought about this, I said, well, how many guys actually have a dad that was a first battle Hall of Famer who was known for a maniacal work ethic, right? Right. And uh, there's there's just this trust factor. There's a lot of guys still in the league and scouts or whatever that were around when Pops played. And they're like, oh, that's like doubting what a Manning would tell you about a quarterback. It's just yeah, you ain't yeah, going to yeah. do it, right? And the other thing, uh, once I did my research, is – Believe it or not, I do do research. I don't just shoot from the hip all the time. <laughs> His dad never ran the 40. Right. Combine, personal workout, ever. So if he's saying, I'm just going to teach him how to play, I taught him how to play before he went to Ohio State. When he went to Ohio State, y'all called him the next Calvin, Megatron, Julio, T.O., y'all, you name them all and put them together and come up with a nickname. That's what y'all been calling him for two years. Who you think made him that way? So now I'm going right. to make him that way going to the NFL. I don't think every kid is going to be in that situation. And I don't think every kid is going to be received as well as Marvin Harrison Jr. If they decide to go this route, but some of them are going to try. They oh, are yeah. definitely going to try. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, you can even look at the, uh, the Caleb Williams of it all too, right? Him not doing medicals at the combine because he didn't want to do 32 different medical checks with 32 different teams when 31 of them ain't going to draft him. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, why, why would I go through all that? I'll go to the teams and I'll do the medical checks with the teams that are bringing me in that are actually interested in me and that actually have a chance to potentially draft me the Chicago bears. And that's like kind of it. Right. But you know, you, I, I think that that's a good move because the other thing that you're doing in that is that you're protecting yourself, right? Like not all 32 teams, medical staffs are created the same. Every fan hates their team's medical staff. Like we know oh. how that goes, but it's true that not all of them are the same. So one of those medical staffs finds something that the other 31 don't. And then all of a sudden 
you're stuck. Like you're in a bad position all of a sudden, or they get something wrong, whatever it might be. Like there's a number of possibilities there. And then you look at a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr., who is in one of the most unique circumstances that we've seen for any draft prospect, right? You had like Joey Porter Jr. last year, and yeah, Marvin Harrison Jr. this year and all that. I feel like it's it's weird watching like all these players that we watched play have their kids come into the league and everything like that but like these are the guys that have the ability to be able to say no no no, i've been there done that even though i haven't been there done that yet and everything and i think that gives them the opportunity to do that but i completely agree with you that you're going to see some players that aren't those guys that are not that type of guy that are not in that position try to fly by with this and i'm curious to see what the reaction is going to be at that point because the thing about setting a precedent right is that you give other people the idea they can go about it but it doesn't mean everybody's going to be successful in the attempt no i can just see one of those gms that's like real just like super super honest with a kid who's like <laughs> no nah, hell no i ain't working out on combine marvin harrison jr didn't work out he was like son your daddy drive a, a school bus. You yeah, need you to have no bus. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you know what I'm saying? So uh, unless he was like in between his his route and he came and taught you and he can show us who he was, your dad ain't Marvin Harrison Jr. It's just what right. it is, man. So, you know, and everything about Marvin is just not talent. That's why I mentioned right. his work ethic. Yep. That's why I mentioned the pedigree and how he went about his business. And one thing about it, you do not live in a house with a man like that and not work. The way Brendan Rice is the same mm -hmm. way. I yep. guarantee you that kid's going to outwork every single person uh, that comes around him or, or wherever he gets into camp. He's going to be a very, very good player because of his pedigree and, and the hard work that came behind it. So uh, I don't like the fact that it just seems like there's a part of this that's missing. Like somebody could like trade a bounty to come up for you and the medicals and all of that stuff. And that stuff might mean a lot to them. So that's fair. Yeah, I, I, I still and I agree with Fred Taylor. Fred Taylor said something like this. What are you hiding? If you if you're a dog, just go be a dog. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to worry about. I just think the kid probably never practiced running the 40 yard dash. You know, right. he probably wishes they hadn't run a 40 yard dash. Keon Coleman. You know yeah. why? Because he was the fastest in the gauntlet. Right. And, and he was the and he was he ran a straight line. He mm -hmm. showed you how coordinated he is, but everybody is dropping him into the second round and ignoring the fact that he got hurt this year. And all they're saying is, I can't draft a receiver that slow. Well, you know what? It might come back and bite somebody in the butt because he might end up being a real good player, all because he ran a slow forty time. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, no, I think it's going to be interesting to see. I think that like. When you when you look at a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr., who has the ability to do what he does and is at the top of his position, then it gives you the freedom to kind of be able to do these things. When you have the pedigree, when you can check every single box there is to check. Marvin Harrison Jr. checks boxes that other people don't even get evaluated on. And I think that that's the thing that sets him apart from the rest of these other guys and these other groups. Like, like Brendan Rice is a perfect example. He's the son of a of a Hall of Famer. He's the son of a, a guy that a lot of people consider the greatest football player to ever step on the on the gridiron. But he's not going to be in a position to do that. And the other thing that I really love about the draft process before we move on here is that you've got two different guys at the top of their position group that took entirely different approaches to the draft. Really, you got a third one too at the top that did it. Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. didn't do a lick. Didn't do anything. Uh, Malik Neighbors did media out of LSU at, uh, at the Combine and did like a little bit of stuff, but didn't do the workouts there. And then Roma Dunce was the last person off the dang field because he was trying to set the, he was trying to hit the three cone uh, time that he wanted. And you know what? All three of them deserve to be the third, the first three wide receivers off the board. It doesn't change anything when it comes down to that. And I don't think that that's going to be something that separates these guys. I think that what's going to be most the biggest thing that's going to separate the three of them is who fits in what offense and what offense is drafting when they're on the board and when they're on the clock. I think that's going to be the biggest thing that's going to make any difference at all between those three guys. I totally agree with you, man. And, and that'll segue and lead right into what we're going to talk about in our next segment, which means where you go actually does matter. What they ask you to do, what type of program, and then little stuff like this. What position is the coach in? Is, is he going to make decisions because he's CYA covering this you-know-what because he wants to survive another year and he just wants a little bit longer? Or one of these guys, are they going to a situation 
with a brand new coach, brand new GM, and they're taking a very macro approach to all of this where instant success doesn't have to be something that happens right away. Absolutely right. We're going to get to all that here as we continue on with today's episode of Locked On NFL. Today's show is brought to you and sponsored by BetterHelp. Look, man, this past year and a half has been rough. Surgeries, death in the families, trying to deal with a lot of stuff. And once I used therapy to get beyond that, I realized there's something else that was missing. I needed to spend more time with my loved ones. I needed to figure out how to divide my time up between work, my own care, and then still spending time with the ones that I love. And therapy is where you can find that. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. Well, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on. All right, everybody, continuing on with this episode of Locked On NFL. And uh, we're going to take a look next at the teams that are drafting towards the back end of the first round and their ability to strike gold. We've seen them do it before. They're in position to do it again. What makes that possible? We're going to answer that as we continue on with today's episode. We appreciate you very much making us your first listen of the day. Hey, with the NCAA tournaments ongoing in basketball for women's and men's college basketball, there's no better place to keep up with all of the action and get your previews ahead of every single one of those games over at Locked On Sports today, the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Go and check them out today so you can keep up with all of the biggest stories around the world of sports. Once again, that is Locked On Sports today, which you can find on YouTube, as well as on the free Amazon TV channels app. So, Tony, here, as we continue to dive in here, we want to keep going draft. And now we're moving into the back part of the first round. You look at some of these teams, and we'll name a couple of them, but you look at some of these teams and their ability to be able to draft at the back end of the first round and sometimes find more success than the guys that draft the quote-unquote sure things. What is it that makes that happen is that about the team is that about the player or is it really just about the fit between the two um it's the fit but it starts with the first thing that you mentioned and i'm glad you framed it that way you gotta know who you are man you yeah, gotta know who man. you you gotta know what your face looks like even when you're not standing looking in the mirror mm -hmm. and th there are teams that have an identity where they don't have to keep checking they don't have to keep looking they know exactly who they are. They know what their purpose is. They're very deliberate and very intentional about everything that they do. They know who fits. They have a role for them before they even draft them. They know exactly what they want them to do. They're not asking them to save the world because they're already a good team. They have the trust of that player because they have a track record of winning which is why they're always on the back end. Yes. Even if they have a bad season, they end up right back like Green Bay. Green Bay is right back where we always mm -hmm. thought they were, were going to be. Baltimore, had, had a, they go right back. It's just some teams find a way to always hover around the playoffs. And, and when you do that, you have just instant credibility. You have happy veterans. You have a building. I know very well what it is, but I don't know what it is because I've experienced it. I know what it is because in Jacksonville, we have missed it. And I mm. keep telling people all the way down to messaging. Everything is intentional. And with teams like that, their picks are intentional, too. The roles that those guys are going to have intentional. Generally, they're good enough. They have solid veterans. You're going to come in. You might have to buy donuts and carry a helmet. You're not 100%. a hero. It, most most bad teams. When they pick in the top 10, whoever they pick is one of their five best players from that day. That mm. doesn't happen with good teams. You have to come in here and you have to figure it out just like a freshman has to figure it out in college. So it starts with the team knowing who they are, knowing what they look like, understanding their identity without standing in front of a mirror. Yeah, Th can't that's just who they are. Yeah, Kansas City is another one of those teams, right? Like they always seem to find the person that's the right fit. You look at Rashi Rice and all that stuff from last year. Like they, these are the teams that are used to doing this. They're good at doing it because they're always doing it. They're always drafting towards that part of the back. But the thing that I love that you mentioned there was the idea that like 
a lot of times when you pick a player in the early part of the first round, they're one of your top five best players. But when you're picked towards the back end, they got to go in there and compete. Competition breeds excellence, Tony. Yes. Like I think that that's such a big piece of it is that sometimes you don't need to spend a first rounder on a guy that's going to come in and start for you. In fact, you'd rather not sometimes as an NFL team. Right now, if you find the right prospect and the right fit and you want to move up and go and grab a guy that, you know, is going to start for you right away. Absolutely. Totally fine. But there's a lot of these teams, Kansas City, Baltimore, Pittsburgh was in that conversation for a while. Um, uh, you know, San Francisco is working there right now. You look at Green Bay as well. These teams, they handle their needs in free agency. And then they draft either the best player available or they draft a spot where they want to generate competition. And that competition pushes these other guys over the top. And that to me is one of the best things. I know that there's always just been this conversation around quarterback, right? Do you want to draft a quarterback that's going to sit behind an established veteran for a while? Or do you want to draft a quarterback that's going to start for you right away? And what we know just based on the data is that oftentimes like the success and hit rate isn't really impacted by either one of those things. Either way, if they're going to work, they're going to work. But I wonder if that conversation is different for different positions, right? Like a wide receiver coming in that only knows how to run three routes because that's what his college asked him to do. Maybe he needs a little bit of time to figure things mm -hmm. out, develop his route tree. How do you do that? You compete, you watch the guys in front of you do it, and you learn. And I think that when you're in a situation to where you get the opportunity to sit back and watch that happen, you're probably in a better position being the third or fourth wide receiver for a year than coming in and being the number one guy unless you already have all of that talent talent established, but those are the guys at the top of the draft, uh, at top of the first round, not the bottom of the first round. So I love that you brought up competition because for me, I think that's one of the things that is such a difference maker. When you arrive on a roster that already has 11 and 11, when it comes to their starting side, you know, their starters for each side, you got to put in work. You don't get to come in and be comfortable. And I think that makes these players better sometimes. It does make them better and it makes the team better. And I believe it increases the, the chances uh, of you getting the type of player that can come in. I, we we were talking earlier with something and the word prospect, and I, and I bring this up mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. It has words in it like likely to do something or yeah. the, the prospect that it likely is more likely to happen than not happen. So when you're picking at the top, the last thing you want to do is be the Charlotte Hornets and – you trade Vladi Diva or trade Kobe Bryant for Vladi Diva, right? Bryant. <laughs> right? That's you, the craziest. You, you, you just can't be that guy that does that, right? You're like, right, right. oh no, we we need the guy that can play right now, not the guy that's going to be like top five all time down the line. No, we need the guy that can play right now. So when you're in that box and you put yourself in that situation, you're desperate. And when you're desperate, you rush it. And when you yeah. don't have to do that, when you can be Baltimore or Kansas City and just sit back and go, yeah, they said he, he wasn't a prospect, but he's good right now. He's good right now, and we're going to play him right now. We're going to put him right there in that spot right here and just tell that kid, this is what you need to do. We'll teach you everything else. It, it's almost the reverse. Mm -hmm. It's like we can take who we want. We can take a prospect. We can even take a guy. We can look at our roster and go, oh, his contract ends in two years. We ain't going to be able to pay him, but we're going to use him for the next two years, but yeah. let's draft his replacement right now. And then yep. injuries happen. So mm -hmm. it's just sometimes, and I'm not saying you're better off picking. If I'm picking first, I don't. If I'm Chicago, I don't want the 28 pick. Oh I no, I'll pick, pick number one in that case. Do like, no doubt, no doubt. But in my mind, I have to take that same approach, even if it's after the first round, in the second, and third, fourth round. You got to start taking that approach, and you got to almost farm system it the way that they do in in baseball. Mm -hmm. And I use the basketball analogy because you notice there are teams that. Pick at the end of the first round, they'll draft some hot shot high school. Look what Oklahoma City is doing. They drafted some guys up top, but then they drafted a whole bunch of people that people was like, oh, we ain't worth it. And guess what? Now they, they might have the number one record in the NBA. Shout out to Locked On NBA, by the way. There but that's go. the truth. Yeah. I'm just saying, man, sometimes just knowing who you are, knowing where you're going long term, choosing macro over micro is the difference in not only your team's success, but the su success of those players that you're bringing into your organization. Yeah. And I do think that it goes beyond the first round. You look at the uh, the Los Angeles Rams, Los Angeles Rams, scooping up Puka Nakua, grabbing a Cooper Cup, like all these guys that they were able to you know find and figure out like later on in the drafts. 
Why? Because they're not often picking in the first round. They trade away those picks to bring in established veterans quite a bit. They almost did it again. They were trying to trade this year and next year's picks for, uh, or, or last year and this year's picks for um, uh, uh, Brian Burns. Yeah. They were trying to get all that done. You know, they were trying mm-hmm. to get out of the first round and everything, but they can do that because the they know they're going to hit late. They yeah. know they're going to hit late. The evaluators do such a great job in day late, you know, in day two, day three, late day two, early day three, whatever it might be. And then so they end up in these situations where, like, you know, we can we can play funny a little bit with these first round picks because we know we're going to be able to come through later on in the draft. And so hey, I, I want to give a shout I, I know, out to that too. I know the Raiders. I know the Raiders. Shout out to my man Q. They're sitting there going. Well, we tried that a couple of years ago. We took a whole bunch of tough guys that know how to fight, and all of them end up in prison. So it's like yeah. So you got to be careful. You, you got to watch your criteria. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah you got to watch guns that. and yeah. And, yeah. and I'm not the, the I'm not even talking about the rug situation because that's a tragedy. Yeah. And, and shout out to yes. the, you know the families and, and all of that. But I'm right. talking about Arnett and the rest yeah. of these dudes that are like, come on, man. Yeah. You know, you can't just go get a whole bunch of dudes that that can fight real good at coyotes too at two o'clock yeah. in the morning you got to actually get professionals guys that love to play football guys that want to show up and, and, and do the things the right way and it seems like teams that aren't in a rush teams that go shopping for players mm-hmm. on a full stomach and, you know you go to the grocery store hungry you go out of the deli you, you go yep. you go get all you that stuff all that's the, perishable you grab all the stuff you don't need you're not you supposed eat, to have you, you want to eat it right now but when your belly's full you just go and slowly shop and have a basket full of stuff and put it in your pantry and you take yeah. a nap and you wake up and whatever you want is in there yeah 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 you you draft a max crosby in that situation which yep. that was one to where like the criteria work they want to Malcolm swear cool. fight Malcolm cool. yep 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 100 100 so sometimes it works but you know you, you gotta got you gotta have the right reason you gotta have the right the right criteria uh that you're looking for and don't show up to the draft hungry address address mm. that in free agency and then get to the draft i'm with you 100 on that all right coming up next we're gonna wrap this up taking a look at the nfl draft chicken and egg problem is it the is it the organizations making the players making bad players bad or is it drafting the bad players that makes the organization bad we're going to break all that down as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of locked on nfl part of locked on podcast network your team every day Man, I tell you, today's show is sponsored by FanDuel. And had I done a better job of looking at the literature on FanDuel, I would have known not to put Kentucky in my parlay, right? Say goodbye to your busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit fanduel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. I'll say it again, fanduel.com slash locked on, one word, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, and bet your heart away, man, and make sure you read the literature and listen to the experts on Fanduel. Well, that, that Kentucky upset was wild, wasn't it? <laughs> Pick me off, man, because it was a throw in. I, 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 I pushed the button right to see. I said, oh, it's an extra $500, and I ain't even got to give away no points. And then they go out there and get whooped. So it's like, that's what I get for being greedy. You know what I'm saying? Hey, <laughs> just, hey. That greed, man. Greed. Can't nobody see? blame you. Hey, Ross, you know what I did? I made my bet on an empty stomach. That's, That's the what you did. See, you I'm see, saying. you're not supposed to. Yes, sir. You ain't supposed to do that. All right, y'all. We appreciate you being here with us for another fun episode of Locked On NFL. Don't forget, we are your team every day. So we'll be right back with you on Monday. Kevin O'Shrecker, making sure you get all the biggest stories from around the league uh, on Monday. Tony Wiggins, Ross Jackson here with you, wrapping up the week uh, and wrapping up this show. Take a look at the NFL draft chicken and egg problem, Tony. When you look at the conundrum. That takes place across the NFL. I think you and I are kind of aligned on this. The development of players. Is it bad teams that are creating the bad development? Or is it bad players not developing that are kind of messing up the teams and the organizations? I kind of always felt the way that I feel about this. and uh, But I will have to give shout outs. I got a little nudge. It was, he, he didn't do it to me, but I just... Uh, Lewis Riddick has been banging on the table about yeah. so many teams that just have poor player development and mm-hmm. all of the the 
the, the turning and, you know, the new GM and the new coach and we got to go in a new direction. Everybody always wants to start off new. It seems like to me there are more guys that get ruined by going to bad organizations than there are guys that go and ruin good organizations because they're bad players. Everybody picks bad players. Everybody picks guys. And you know what I call bad? I don't even call bad just not being as good as everyone thought you were. I, I call bad quitting. I call bad getting a little bit of money and spending too much time in the club and, and not having a work ethic because the, the NFL is so much about – Ross, they get punched in the face all day long. So you got to be built for that, man. And if, you, and if, and if you're going to let anything distract you, you can't be a part of an organization. I think organizations need to do a better job of vetting. I think organizations I, – I, I cover a team – they have the greatest intentions on earth, but sometimes they set it up so that these guys aren't sharpening themselves against the other mm -hmm. person because they want to believe in people so bad. That's not the way that this goes. You have to, I learned something. I always do this, but let me tell you where I learned this from. I was watching mm -hmm. dog trainers and I, these, these high performance dogs like Belgian Malois and Rottweilers mm -hmm. and Connor Corsos and Presser Canarios, they got one thing in common. If you don't work them, they'll tear your house up. They want yeah, to work. True. They want to work. They want a job. They want to be Get doing something. Get me out something. of here, man. Let mm -hmm. me let me pray drive. Let me climb up on that fence. Let me walk across the tightrope. That's only the Belgian because the rest of them can't do it. I saw a Belgian out while walking backwards like Michael Jackson across the tightrope. I'm like, I ain't no damn dog. But but still, you better take him out there and let him do it because if not, he's going to break dance in your living room. So I just think that I think big time athletes, big time athletes that are just yoked a certain way. Hey, man, where to work at? Yep. We, we ain't working. And that's when you start seeing guys pouting. Jalen Ramsey cried on the Jaguars bench, and you could read his lips. He said, I'm tired of losing. Mm. I just think so many players, you got to just put them in the right situation. That's why all those dudes complaining about the Patriot way. Man, please. You know why y'all got all those rings? Because of all of that foolishness that that man put y'all through up there. And you need yep. to be thanking your lucky stars and don't worry about the – y'all 38, 39, you can go party now. You can go to South Beach all you want to Yeah, you're good but, now, bro. Just yeah, man. <laughs> man, you just got to do the job when it's time to do the job. And I just think that starts with the expectation from the day you walk into that building. If you think it's sunshine and rainbows and club med, you're going to do what the Romans do. You're going to act just like them. But mm -hmm. if you go in there and there's some veterans and there's a presence and there's a work ethic and there's a way to do your business, then guess what? you're going to get acclimated to it, especially if they make the right choice. Yeah, I think the I think the NFL's biggest problem is its lack of patience. There's just no patience. And Pete Carroll talked about this, too, at the combine where he taught. I think it was last year's combine where he talked about Geno Smith, everything and saying like, yeah, you know, like, you know, they they got a great year out of Geno Smith a couple of years ago. And one of the things that Pete Carroll talked about was like, we're glad we didn't give up on. Because I think that he was talking about how the NFL gives up on quarterbacks too quickly and everything. And I think that's true. I think that that's not even just quarterbacks. I think that that goes all across. And along with that, that dog trainer analogy that you use uh, or example that you use, I mean, we see this in, in people all the time. These little smart kids that are like way ahead of their way ahead of their grade or way ahead of what they're being taught in classes and everything. They're bored yep. and they start acting out. I watch that happen all the time because I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't smart enough to be that kid. But I knew other people that were smart enough to be that kid, everything. And, you know, what they do, they, they took them out. They put them in, you know, gifted and talented classes and like all this other stuff and like gave them other stuff to do, got them involved and then, you know, reeled them in a little bit. But you need patience in order to do that. And I get it. I get it. If you're an NFL organization, sometimes it's hard to have patience because you're spending millions of dollars on that player, right? Or you're getting ready to have to make a decision about a fifth year option for a quarterback. And that's a $25 million decision you got to make before May 20th or whatever the deadline is. You know what I mean? And so like, I get that sometimes that can be that the money drives the impatience, but uh, it, it, I think that the impatience at some point makes you make bad decisions with your money. I think it goes both ways. Is it because imagine, you know, looking at, um, I don't know, let's let's use the New Orleans Saints for an example, right? The team that I cover. The Saints went out and they signed Chase Daniel. Now, I would say not Chase Daniel, uh, Chase Young. When they signed Chase Young, now they built out a contract that makes a lot of sense. And then they, you know, prorated the likely to be earned incentives so that it doesn't handy, you know, it doesn't handcuff them or anything like that. 
they did it in a way that makes sense. But right. they also, in the past two years, past three seasons, have drafted two edge rushers in the first two rounds in Peyton Turner a couple of years ago out of Utah and then Isaiah Foskey last year out of uh, Notre Dame. And so is that free agency signing a wise thing to do, $13 million to spend if you've got guys that you just need to be patient with and how patient are you willing to be, right? So that conversation does go both ways and it tips the hat to both. Should you be patient with the player or does the patient or does the player need your patience? You got to figure out kind of where that is and what's worth it. But I think that patience is one of the biggest things that the NFL lacks right now. I always felt bad for Herm Edwards, and I know he's not the only one. And you use the Saints as an example. I'm not even tripping on Dennis Allen because if Dennis Allen don't win this year, they're going to run him out of there. I, I see you and I understand. Yeah, this is, is this is his shot right here. Yeah, this is so great. I always felt bad for Herm Edwards when he was in Kansas City because you know what Herm Edwards did? Herm Edwards just gutted the whole team <laughs> and went young with all those draft picks, right? And they fired him. He didn't get rewarded. Right. He didn't even he get did, a chance. Yeah. <laughs> he did right by the organization, did everything he was supposed to do. But guess what? See you later. So yeah. I know how guys are, man, when they want to protect themselves. But if done correctly, you got to take the macro approach to this thing, man. And you got to try to be the one thing Andy Reid did in Philly. He didn't win a championship. Right. But for like over a decade, he was knocking on that door and, mm -hmm. and, and he just couldn't get over the hump. Now, he needed to go to Kansas City to get over the hump, but guess what? It happened, and he yep. was still consistent. He was still doing things the way that they were supposed to be done, and he stuck to it and eventually started paying off for him. So I, I do think they do have a real serious development problem, a developmental problem in NFL. And one reason they have a developmental problem is because it's a copycat league. Yes. You can't be like somebody else. Remember a few years ago when Golden State was doing it and then Houston Rockets went and got all those shooters? <laughs> and the first thing I asked is like this. You ain't going to outshoot Golden State. What are no, you doing? No, you don't you have them. <laughs> you need to go get big. I don't care yeah. how good James Harden and watch the Westbrook. You ain't going to out Golden State, Golden State. And right. all of these teams are trying to out do, do something that the other team has mastered. Nobody ever tried to be New England unless a coach went somewhere else to try to make them New England. And it didn't work. You have to find a way to know who you are and be yourself and create your own identity. And I think yep. too many teams fail at that. Yep. This is why I like the former player coach approach. D'Amico Ryan's so quickly developed, so quickly developed a culture, developed the players, did all that. Gerard Mayo in New England. It's not going to happen quick there, more than likely. However, the patience will be there because he's been there. He's been in those shoes. He knows what it takes. And he knows that persistence is above all else when it comes to development. And so that's why I like the former player coach approach, because I think that that will take. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why the Baltimore Ravens draft so well. Ozzy, hello. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, I think that's one of those things. So, yeah, no, great conversation, man. I I'm so excited for the NFL draft this year, too. It's a it's a loaded first round in this class. And I think you're going to see guys selected at 30, 31, 32 that are going to pop off like pretty in a pretty big way. So I'm really, yep. really excited to see all of it. Totally agree. Totally agree. It's been fun, man, as always. 100%. We appreciate y'all very much for being here. For Tony Wiggins at Shop Talking Wig, I am Ross Jackson at Ross Jackson Nola. We'll see you again here soon on the Locked on NFL podcast. Don't forget, we are your team every day. We appreciate you very much for making us your first listen and for being an everydayer here on the show. Kevin O'Striker, we'll see you on Monday, and we will see you here next week on Locked on NFL, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.